A lot of the data in our computing lives doesn't live on our devices. It lives in the amorphous term known as the cloud. It's also where a lot of computation itself takes place. Today we'll explain what the cloud really is. Welcome to Copec Explain Software, the podcast where we make computing intelligible. This week, Dave, we're discussing the cloud. I guess we'll start with, well, where is the cloud? The cloud resides in data warehouses. You can think about these as big buildings with a lot of air conditioning that have a lot of computers in them. And they're server computers. They exist on racks. And these have existed going back to the beginning of the internet and even before the internet. So it's not unusual to have large buildings with a lot of computers where a lot of computing power exists. So what is unusual about the cloud or what, when we say the cloud, what do we mean? Well, while going back to the 1960s, we've always had data in remote computers that got accessed. What's changed over the last 15 years is how flexible and dynamic those online services are, and how they can be programmatically managed by companies that need to build products quickly who don't want to manage their own servers. Let's take a step back and talk about the difference between clients and servers, which is something we've talked about on prior episodes. When we say client, that's the computing device that you use, something like your smartphone or your laptop. When we say server, that's a computer that many different people access to do some computation or access some data. So large companies, large applications have many servers that many of their users access all the time. What's happened over the last 15 years is instead of companies having their own servers that maybe they have in their own data warehouse, or just having a few specific servers that they're renting in a data warehouse, there are companies like Amazon Web Services or Microsoft's Azure or Google Cloud that provide these resources on demand as needed in a very dynamic way. So anybody who needs to spin up some computing power or some storage out there on servers can do it very seamlessly and in a programmatic fashion where it's all automated instead of having to think about this is my specific server that I'm going to manage. This isn't just for companies, this is for individuals too. Anybody today can take advantage of Amazon Web Services. You can be a one-person startup, or you can be a large corporation like Apple. For example, there was recently an article about how Apple, which has many of its own data centers too, also is a customer of Google Cloud. We've talked about this a lot on the show before, about how companies who seem like competitors often also are intermingled, intermixed in terms of using each other's products or services. So even Apple uses Google Cloud, but... Google Cloud is accessible to everybody. I can go and spin up servers on Google Cloud or use computing resources or storage resources on Google Cloud as well. So when I take a photo on my phone, it is stored in the cloud. Can you explain the language a little bit? Because I kind of imagine it as like a little cloud following me around, but that's not really what's happening. The cloud is just another set of computers. It's another set of computers that just don't exist where you are right now. Mm -hmm. You have your smartphone. That's a computer. You take a photo, your photo gets uploaded to servers, and it used to be if it was the 1990s that whatever photo service you were using had some specific server that they were managing. Instead, they're paying another company like Google, Microsoft, or Amazon to manage those computers for them in their data warehouses that dynamically spin up as more storage or computing power is needed by the photo application. So your photo might actually exist on your device, as it does with many photo apps, but some photo apps also sync it to the cloud. For example, if you're using Google Photos or you're using Apple's iCloud, you're actually having a copy of your photo usually there on your smartphone, and there's another copy that's being uploaded into the data warehouse that might be managed by Amazon or Google or Microsoft. So we really have to trust these companies that are going to hold all of our data and information. Right. And basically, all of the data that you use in almost any app today is existing in, quote unquote, the cloud. That's why the term is so amorphous. And it's almost not a great term because it basically means anything today that's on a server, because almost everybody uses these dynamic cloud hosting companies instead of managing their own servers. So every time you do email, every time you use iMessage, every time 
you use a photo app. Every time you go and download an app from the app store, you're connecting to the cloud, transmitting data either up or down from the cloud. You're basically using the cloud every time you go to almost any website. You're using the cloud anytime you do almost anything that's related to the internet. So for a individual computer user, this is a, a shift. It used to be that all of our data or any of the applications that we're using were really housed on our device and our computer. And now the applications that we're using, we're actually communicating with other computers to do whatever it is we're trying to do. Right. And as the internet has become more prevalent, this line has blurred more and more and more. Mm -hmm. So the internet became a public entity, not just a government and academic entity, starting in the early to mid 1990s. And before that, if you had a personal computer, basically all of your data was just living there on your personal computer. In the early World Wide Web and through basically the mid-00s, there was still a pretty clear line where you were using an app on your computer and most of the data was just staying on your computer. And when you were using a specific internet application, such as your email client or a web browser, some of the data was living on servers. Now, when you're using almost any application, some of the data is pretty much living on these servers. And this whole idea of these servers being dynamically allocated and managed by third parties is where the term the cloud came about. Can you dive into the dynamically allocated term? Like, what do you mean by that? So if you wanted to have a web server in the late 1990s or early 00s, generally what you would do is you'd go to a web hosting company and you would rent basically some space on an individual computer in their data warehouse. The way that Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud work is you're not really going and renting space on one specific server. You're renting access to some compute time, some compute power, some storage capacity. And you're not worrying about what is the specific machine that's doing this. You're just having an instance of some time on some machine. Or sometimes you get a dedicated machine, but you're not really individually managing it. And no one's really going and individually thinking about that individual machine too much other than to do maintenance as you would on any piece of hardware. It's a lot less about individual machines and more about on-demand resources. And those resources are scattered across huge networks of many, many, many machines. But you as an individual user or even somebody who's using many of those machines is able to use APIs to request more resources, to no longer use some resources. And all of this happens just seamlessly without having to think about what's actually going on at the individual machine level. So it makes it much easier for a company to scale its use of resources, because all of that can happen automatically instead of having to think about individual machines. What it's really done is it's commoditized storage and computing power. It's made it so that it really doesn't matter whether you're buying services from any of these cloud providers. They all basically offer the same thing. Some of them will have some nice add-ons or nice integrations that make working with them a little bit better or a little bit worse. But it's more has really become about price and it's more just about how much resources do you need and which company offers the nicest interface to those resources. Now, unfortunately, it also means that it's gotten harder and harder for smaller data warehousing companies to compete because Microsoft, Google and Amazon have economies of scale. They have such sophisticated tools for managing these networks. They have such large buying power and such great scale in terms of their use of electricity and cooling, et cetera, et cetera, that it's possible for them to really offer scalability that smaller competitors can't match. So people sometimes see the cloud as kind of like a scary term, but really it just means data's on a server. And when we talk about the cloud today, we're really usually talking about these large services like Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, or Amazon Web Services, and the scalability and programmatic access that they provide to corporations. Really, the cloud term is a marketing term. The cloud term is definitely a marketing term. And people just use it anytime they talk about data going on a server. So they don't always specifically mean AWS or Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud. They might just mean 
oh, hey, um, you're going to send that data away from your personal device and up to a server. So it's going to, quote unquote, the cloud. Mm -hmm. So there is an actual cloud holding our data places. No, and it's really not a new concept. Like we talked about at the beginning of the episode, there has been data on remote computers that people access going all the way back to the early history of computing in Mm -hmm. the 1960s. So it's not a new idea. It's just new about the scale and the dynamicism of the current cloud providers. That's what's really new. Amazon really kicked off this new era in cloud computing with the launch of Amazon Web Services in 2006. It's actually one of the most profitable parts of Amazon has been since the creation of Amazon Web Services. Amazon Web Services actually supported losses on the retail side for many years. So a lot of people don't realize what an important part of Amazon it really is. For many years, it seemed like Microsoft and Google were really playing catch up in this area. Today, they're very much viable competitors and they often are competing for very large contracts. So, for example, recently the government was thinking about some military applications and they were kind of shopping around Microsoft Azure versus Amazon Web Services. And then it got kind of political why they chose one versus the other. But the point being that they do offer very similar services. And so it's actually not that unusual for large corporations to actually make use of multiple of them. And what you're getting on demand usually is one of two things. Either it's storage so storing files, storing data, or it's compute. So this is actually using remote servers for doing computation. You talked earlier about privacy. One of the elements of that is that our smartphones today are actually incredibly capable computers, and they can do a huge amount of computation. And one of the advertising angles that Apple's kind of using against Google in the kind of iOS versus Android wars is we do a lot more of the computation on device, so your privacy is more protected because your data is not going up to Google servers. So you think about something like doing photo recognition, right? A lot of that does happen in the cloud. When you put a photo on a Facebook and it figures out whose faces are in it, that's obviously being done in the cloud. When you do that with Google Photos, it's being done in the cloud. But Apple advertises that it can do a lot of that on device with the advanced neural circuitry that's in their latest microprocessors in their iPhones. However, Google started incorporating advanced neural processors in its phones as well. And so has Samsung and basically everybody who makes phones. So it's not necessarily something that couldn't be done, but Apple's just positioning themselves as we're the company that does more of our computation on device instead of doing more of it in the cloud. There are downsides to that sometimes from a technical perspective, Because you, when you have smaller data sets, it's harder to run a lot of these machine learning algorithms. And so we need to go to the cloud often to get a large enough data set that we can actually run some of these algorithms. So for example, if you think about something like recognition within photos, right, you're going to have a better ability to inference anytime a photo contains a mountain when you run the algorithm over millions, if not billions of photos that have mountains in them and train it on those than if you just trained it on the photos in your device of mountains. Now, what you could do is do that training ahead of time and then just have the model live on the device. But still, at some point, you needed access to a huge number of photos to actually run the training in the first place. Another place this is really prevalent and discussed in terms of privacy is in voice assistants. So you think about something like Amazon's Alexa or Apple Siri or Microsoft's Cortana, They need huge data sets in order to have really effective voice recognition and good natural language processing. That's why all the time, every time you talk to Alexa and every time you talk to Siri, that data is often being sent out into the cloud, not just for the purposes of doing the computation to answer your request, but also for the purposes of learning how to do better voice recognition and natural language processing in the future from the data that you created with your voice. All of our data, when it goes to the cloud, could be used for these large data sets. And it often is. No matter what service you're using, whether it's Facebook or Google Photos or some of Apple services as well, your data is basically going to the cloud to be used for training machine learning models for improving their services. And that's another like type of scale that they have. They have access to so many users and they have so much data in the cloud 
that they can be a lot more effective with these machine learning algorithms than a smaller competitor could be. So we went on a bit of a tangent, but to summarize, the cloud is really just computing storage or computing power that is not on your own personal devices. And your apps all the time are connecting to the cloud, transmitting your data to it. And it is oftentimes, when we talk about it today, one of three services, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, or Google Cloud, that are actually handling the back end, handling the dynamic capacity for storage and compute for almost any app that you're using. But this whole concept of just having your data on another computer somewhere else that you're accessing goes way back. And so these modern services are just providing a nice interface and economies of scale and, for access. and access for companies to build on. All right. Well, thanks for listening to us this week. Rebecca, how can people get in touch with us on Twitter? We're at Copec Explains, K-O-P-E-C-E-X-P-L-A-I-N-S. Feel free to shoot us a tweet and let us know topics that you're interested in us covering in the future. And we hope you have a fantastic week. Don't forget to hit follow or subscribe. Thanks for listening.